All right. So allow me to open uh, this session before I give uh, the time back to Professor Maltzman, right? So have a very good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session, this morning session with Professor Rich Maltzman. We are going to discuss about the managing yeah, large scale projects and sustainability. And uh, my name is Yudo Angora, the director of the Jakarta campus of the uh, MBA program in uh, SBM ITB, the School of Business and Management Institute of Technology, Bandung. Allow me to say hi to some of our uh, participants here. I see we have Pa Aris, our lecturer in project management. Pa Aris, have a very good morning, Pa. Hope you can hear me. Ah, very good. Thank you, Pa Yudo, Mr. <laughs> Professor Rudis Maltzman, uh, just introduce myself as one of the lecturer in SBM ITB on project management. Yeah, pa, pa Aris here is our lecturer. Dr. Aris Firman is our lecturer in project management. And of course, looking forward to hear more uh, case of uh, infrastructure and project management in, in, in the US as well from Professor Maltzman. And allow me also to say hi to one of our students here, we have Pak Ihsan. Are you there, Pak Ihsan? Morning, morning, Pak Ihsan. Ah, okay. Pak Ihsan here is, uh, wait, hopefully I, I say it correctly. You are the CEO of Aurecon. Is it Aurecon? I'm the country manager of Aurecon. Uh, Aurecon. It's Australian engineering company. Uh, Pak Yudo, yeah. So you, you are quite oh, experienced yeah. in managing large infrastructure projects. Yeah, well. I'm, I'm a QS5 yeah. background, but I've been uh, doing a... Uh, uh, in construction projects for the last 25 years. So I'm looking forward to this uh, webinar uh, from Boston University from Professor Matsman. Looking forward to hearing very your side, uh, Professor. Very good, very good. And uh, well, yeah, because uh, we have lots of infrastructure projects as well. Yeah, but it's an, and correct, one of, correct, uh, but we are busy, but yeah. Yes, we are busy. And one of the large projects, I assume, is like the movement of the capital city. That's, that's correct, uh, that's correct, yeah. Projects there, right? Yeah. And yes, uh, students, participants, lectures. Uh, today's uh, session is basically our collaboration with Boston University. <laughs> Here we have three series of lectures. Two are managed by Jakarta campus, and then one is going to be managed by Bandung campus with Dr. Yunita Nainggolan as the director here. So tomorrow, yeah, Dr. Nainggolan, for the session with Boston University with Dr. Yeah. Ilana. It's tonight, Kutu. actually. Oh, tonight, tonight. 9 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> but tomorrow morning in Boston. Tomorrow morning in Boston. Okay, that's good. Very good. So yeah, this is our effort to have a close and better relationship with our university partner, and this time is with Boston University. As mentioned by Kate before, uh, for the incoming intake for the double degree program, uh, we will send four MBA students uh, to Boston. Yeah, so this is going to be like through one plus one uh, arrangement, one year in uh, SBM ITB, and then the remaining uh, one year will be in Boston, uh, learning about some of the uh, programs there, including, I believe, uh, what do what you call it, MBA in, in applied business analytics, financial management, supply chain management, project management, global marketing, enterprise risk management, and administrative studies. Lots of things that we can learn with Boston University. So yeah, without further ado, uh, we are going to have like an approximately 45 minutes of uh, lecture, followed by uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. And yeah, let's give a warm applause to Dr. or to Professor Rich Maltzman from Boston University. So Prof. Maltzman, the time is yours. Yes, you can hear me okay, is that correct? It's quite clear, it's very okay. clear. Thank you. Well, Salamat Pagi. Um, Good morning, uh, Pagi. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here virtually. It would be nice to be there for real or for you to be here for real, but for now we'll deal with what we have. Um, so the topic is um, sustainability in large scale projects or managing large scale projects and sustainability, I should say with sustainability. And the main kind of theme is um, to give you a green light, like you just saw to think through the end of your project. And you just saw that car drive right off the screen to give you that uh, idea. Uh, the main topics today, uh, kind of setting the stage for large scale projects to let you know it's not only about green, which is a stereotype I think sustainability sometimes gets. Um, it's not about saving whales and saving snails. Well, it is, but it's not only about that. There's a little bit about cognitive science uh, and uh, uh, some other items that come from our book. So Dave Shirley and I wrote a book uh, 
now 12 years ago called Green Project Management. It won the PMI Project Management Institute's Cleveland Award for Literature, uh, which um, made us very happy uh, because there was a little bit of buy-in to this idea of project management, uh, thinking about the longer term way back then, um, but only recently has it really caught on. Um, we'll talk about uh, life cycle thinking, mindset, changing tools, and then we'll come back to that main message of thinking through the green light. But the overall takeaway today, the main message is to try to give you a green light to not limit your thinking to the ribbon cutting ceremony or whatever the final day final day is of the project that you're um, that you're running. Um, I did a little bit of research here, and with the help of the folks uh, from the university, um, got some example large scale projects, and I went even further and looked at well, what's driving those projects. Um, and I found uh, Indonesia's Vision 25, um, 2045, uh, I don't want to rush it, um, which has the miss uh, mission to significantly transform Indonesia with the target of becoming one of the world's top four or five, I've seen both numbers, four or five economies by the time it reaches a 100-year anniversary in 2045. Now, what does that have to do with large-scale projects? Well, I really like to refer to this uh, diagram called the Strategy Execution Framework. It was featured in a PMI paper uh, a while ago. It actually um, is property of IPS Learning and Stanford University. I actually worked with some of those folks have permission to use the drawing. Uh, and really what that's about is connecting the, at the top here, you see the purpose, vision, values, identity, what's, what they call ideation through things like nature and vision to strategy. And then to finally to operations, but there's only one touch point here between strategy and project program and portfolio management, and that is right here. And so this golden thread, the idea of the golden thread is that there's a connectivity such that a person in operations, um, maybe a student who graduates from your operations management program and becomes a factory uh, director um, can, can connect projects taking place in that factory with programs and portfolios, with the strategy, with the goal, with the long range intention, with the purpose and can say, this is why I'm doing this project. So at the very top here, we have this ideation, see it in the upper right hand corner, ideation. I, uh, I usually just refer to it as the mission, vision and values. Um, that can be linked to what I saw in Visi Indonesia 2045. Um, these four pillars, these are kind of mission level visionary statements about all of the work um, that the government does, including the creation of things like the MRT uh, project. The next step down or closer to operations is engagement. See it in the upper right hand corner here. That's where you have your goals and goals are the what you want to accomplish. Strategy is the how you're going to accomplish it. So we're talking about um, this link uh, between goals and strategy right here. And that takes you to engagement. But before we talk about engagement, let's bring in one of the projects. And I wasn't able to get all the information I needed because my, um, my Indonesian language skills are poor. Um, but I was able to get from the a university a link that gave me the vision statement of the project and the mission statement of the project. I won't read them all to you here. Um, I'll read the vision, but not the mission. And then if you want more details, the link is down here in the lower right. The vision statement of the project to become the most advanced public transport service provider committed to encourage economic growth by providing the people with better and more efficient means of commuting. Now, built into efficient, I hope, is not just getting to a certain place on time, but also the use of fuel. I'm going to make that leap of faith uh, now. So the next step down is synthesis. This is our bailiwick as project managers. This is where we live. This is projects programs, uh, and portfolios. So we're now talking about this link here between strategy and portfolio management, portfolios being a collection uh, of programs and projects and maybe some operations. In the case of Visi 2045, it's these projects here, portfolios of projects like the ones you see here, um, with a, a goal and a metric to have this accomplished by um, uh, uh, expansion of expansion of 7.2% in 2022. Uh, and this is coming from um, some data that I collected. 
Um, overall, when you think about large scale projects, there are problems, solutions, and things that you do in practice. In this lecture, talk, discussion, I'm gonna focus on this area right here. Um, the problems involved with lack of focus, un which is actually happening right now because of my over animation here. Um, lack of focus um, and unclear goals as problems. Um, and then managing strategy as a way to fix that, resulting in clear objectives, responsibility, and creating milestones, some of which are past the project's end date. And that's an important piece. Now I'm gonna go a little act interactive here. And I wonder, I, I'm gonna guess no, but does anyone know what they're looking at here? Very specifically? Anyone? Well, what is it, a pipe? So you're actually looking underneath <laughs> Boston right now in what we call the Big Dig. It was a large scale project that we put in place um, now decades ago. Um, very, very large federal, federally funded project, much like some of these Indonesian projects. And what I really want you to pay attention to are those lines, those little straps. Because what those straps are, does anyone want to guess? As a support? No. They're holding up the lights. That's They're holding up the lights. There are 25,000 of these light fixtures. Each weighs 110 pounds. Those straps had to be installed because the light fixtures started to fall down from the wall about a year after installation. Designed to last 20 years, they started to fall almost immediately, well, relatively, a year after they were installed. Um, it cost $54 million US dollars and multiple lane closures to fix this problem. Several officials were fired and the cause was listed as galvanic corrosion due to salt and water in the environment. And in Boston, we get snow, maybe not so much in Indonesia, um, but you have salt, um, in the environment, you have different materials, you have uh, the presence of electricity, heat and cooling, and so you have rapid uh, corrosion. But that, in my mind, was not the real cause. The root cause was that the holistic consideration of the long term was very weak in this project. They were not thinking about benefits. They were not thinking about collecting value. In this case, value is lights that are not falling on drivers. <laughs> Um, and there were many, actually, many examples of short-term thinking in the Big Dig project. So when you're done with, done with this talk, I'm hoping that the takeaways here are, one, it's not always about green. There's nothing here about saving whales or snails. Um, this was about long-term thinking, long-term benefits. They could be economic or, in this case, just safety um, and not results that are geared towards only the very end of the project. And it's more about this idea of long-term thinking and the perspective of thinking about BRM, Benefits Realization Management. Bottom line, the product of your project, whether it's a, a transit um, system or a large building or a set of buildings, it goes on and on for years, decades, maybe even centuries after the project is launched. And just consideration of that simple fact taken back into the planning of the project makes a big, big difference. So really, it's a thinking situation. How do we think now, recognize that, and recognizing that we may have to shift that thinking? Now, I found this piece to be super fascinating. Um, one of my favorite project management writers is someone named Ruth Pierce. She's shown on the left there. Um, she's a, a lawyer and a PMP. And she's done significant studies in what are called character strengths. And this happens to be a US study. Uh, these are character strengths, things like gratitude, curiosity, creativity, um, forgiveness, all different human character skills. And I know this is soft skill stuff, but she did some detailed scientific studies on this. The orange line represents the US general population in kind of a general ranking of the character strengths from honesty down to self-regulation. This does not mean that US uh, population is poor at self-regulation. It means just that that's the last, the lowest relatively of the different um, character strengths and honesty was actually the highest. 
what I find fascinating is the difference between regular people <laughs> and project managers. The blue being the project managers, we are much stronger than the average US population in teamwork. Thankfully, what do we do? We build teams, we focus them on a project goal, and we get work done through those people. That is the mantra of project management. But our second lowest score relative to the US population is in perspective. And I think, I assert that makes sense because we are so focused on getting things done that we do not look in the longer term. We do not think about different aspects. We don't think about what our project's stakeholders are, or who all of our project stakeholders are, and it actually becomes limiting, especially in terms of long-term thinking. So we need to make a shift in the way we look at projects, the way we look at stakeholders, and the way we look at the world. And that starts by figuring out where we really fit in the scheme of things and what we really do as project managers. Now, another way to look at that strategy execution framework is to think about it as a set of gears. We're at the top kind of driving everything, maybe at the CEO or the C-suite level and in government, maybe directors and above is this idea of an overall far reaching purpose and then the strategy, the how, we're going to get to that, uh, to the goals we set up with our far-reaching strategy. And of course, there's the MRT in service, right? That's steady state operations. So in the case of uh, Indonesia, you have this vision, 2045, that says we're going to uh, elevate ourselves in the realm of the different countries, become a developed country, um, and have, a, um, have a, an amazing and improved rapid transit uh, scenario. You can come to Boston and experience our not so advanced trolley system uh, that runs along Commonwealth Avenue where our university is located. I hope you get that experience, um, pretty interesting. Uh, in any case, there's a cog between those two, the red here and the green, called portfolios of programs and projects. That's the synthesis state in the strategy execution framework. And without that, the overall purpose and far-reaching strategy does not connect with uh, steady state operations. We are, uh, as project managers, um, we are a focal point. We are, I like to say, where the rubber hits the road. It's where these ideas, um, the mission, the vision and value, which are just ideas, become real. Um, they become able to operate. That's this focal point uh, right here. So, I like pictures of fancy cars. So there's an example of where the rubber hits the road. Actually, this picture comes into play because I taught the class, I taught this, um, I did this uh, webinar for the Northern, actually for the all the chapters of uh, Italy happened to be sponsored by the Northern Italy chapter in Milan. That was the last trip that I was able to take before COVID hit. One of my other colleagues in Australia named Alexandra Chapman, Alex, we call her, is a thought leader in this area. She and her company, Totally Optimized uh, Projects, has this really good model that basically says, as project managers, we're task-oriented. We look at activities. Those activities, let's say wiring a house as one of the activities, uh, produces an outcome. The wiring is ready. Um, those desired outcomes produce benefits, which over time produce value. Uh, most project managers stop their thinking at the end of outcomes. Um, they also aren't as connected as I'm asserting we should be to the drivers that would say, this is what we value in the first place. In our book that I held up for you before, uh, we talk about a rainbow of green, um, meaning there are different kinds of projects. Some projects are green by definition. Uh, installation of a wind farm or a solar farm, um, an effort to save a certain species of parakeet. Um, those would be green projects. Okay, But every project really should have some element to it that is at least somewhat sustainability long-term focused. The problem is when a project is 
a wind farm. Well, the people working on that are already aware of things like climate change and the United Nations SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and, and that's already there. Um, but as we move to green in general, the necessary sustainability focus of a project manager goes up. We don't really need it here because it's kind of baked into the mindset of the project team. But over here, we're working on a new app or a new single serve coffee maker. We aren't necessarily focused on it. And I'll give you a real example. Keurig is a manufacturer of single serve coffee makers like Nestle is in Europe and I think Asia. Um, and they developed a single serve coffee maker that used a non-recyclable uh, cup. They called it a K cup. Those plastic cups um, were manufactured in the billions and are now in landfills, something like 35 to 40 billion of them, which have a 500 year life before they degrade into who knows what are now in landfills. And yet the company Keurig is at the time was owned by Green Mountain Coffee, a company that had very high level, very strong commitment, supposedly to the environment. And yet that coffee maker hit the market with non-recyclable K-cups. And again, 35 billion plastic K-cups are now in landfills. So what we're talking about here is uh, something you may be familiar with from your business training, um, the cost of quality. You may have heard of this, uh, Philip Crosby, uh, a, a thinker in project, uh, sorry, in quality management, um, came up with the idea of the cost of quality. And what he said was, pay me now, or pay me later. In other words, you can pay for um, maintenance, training, things like this in advance and end up with better results, or you can skimp on those items and pay me later because things have blown up. So I've just applied that to sustainability. There's the cost of good sustainability on the right and the cost of poor sustainability on the left. Costs of um, poor sustainability are the things that go wrong if you do not consider the long term. And this is more environmentally focused. So things like um, internal failures within your shop uh, that occur um, in a construction project, it could be needing to rebuild a section of the building because the uh, workers were not properly trained in some aspect of the construction. Those are not seen by the public. Then there are external failures. Failures, Maybe something literally collapses and someone is injured. Now you have uh, fines and lawsuits. These are all the costs of poor sustainability. The cost of good sustainability, it's not free directly. His book was called Quality is Free because the net is free, but you have to invest. You have to do things like tests and audits, certifications, training, planning, awareness about sustainability. And so that's the same equation that there is for quality can be applied to uh, sustainability. A real example of this, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, is the Deepwater Horizon um, explosion that took place in the Gulf of Mexico uh, not that long ago. Um, this was operated by BP and they were renting uh, space on the uh, Transocean, a vessel um, uh, owned by Transocean. There was a movie made about this with big name stars like John Malkovich and Mark Wahlberg, a Hollywood movie that is. Um, the first 20 minutes of the movie are worth watching. Uh, if you're a project manager, a construction manager, an energy manager, watch the first 20 minutes because it's really about decision-making under threat under risk and the different stakeholders and the pressures in making long-term oriented decisions. Um, John Malkovich plays a BP executive who was not at all um, about the long-term decisions. Just get the oil out of the water and leave. That was his philosophy. Um, if you use that equation, the cost of good sustainability and poor sustainability, on the left are the costs of poor good sustainability. Not that much. Well, it's $20 million, nothing to laugh at, but relative to a company like BP, relatively small. Um, on the right, sorry, you see the monetary costs, not even counting the human loss. 11 people were killed, 17 were injured. Fishing was damaged. Actually, I have friends from New Orleans who tell me that still there are some strange looking shrimp 
being fished from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we're talking about $55 billion of purely monetary costs. Um, so you can see that the scale breaks here um, with a ratio of 0.036%. If they had spent the money on things like a, um, a, a test that Schlumberger uh, could, could have done on the integrity of the well um, and the cement in the well. Whole books have been written about this. But here's the fascinating part to me. Because this was inve investigated by the US government, documents from BP were made available to the public. This is their risk register. And their risk register was a corporately issued risk register that had a list of risk categories. You see it down here health and safety, environment, and so forth, reputation, cost, schedule, production, and so forth. Well, guess what? Um, the local project manager supervisors were incentivized on these items here on the right. So what did they do? They went into the software and deleted these from the dropdown. So these risks weren't even able to be identified by the project managers. Um, the dropdown only included cost, schedule, production, reserves, and other risks that actually had to do with things that they were incentivized on. Um, that was a big deal when they went to court. BP as a corporate, their vision had these um, left-hand side green um, threats identified, threats and opportunities. Okay, so how do we shift our thinking here? One of the ways to do it is to invoke life cycle thinking. Now, I know Indonesia has some Dutch roots. I lived in the Netherlands for two years as an expat. Um, and when I did, I just I um, became a fan of Harry Mullish. He's an author. He wrote a book called The Discovery of Heaven. I will not read you the whole book. <laughs> just want to talk about the table of contents. Here is his table of contents. Pretty weird. The beginning of the beginning, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end, and the end of the end. That's his table of contents to the book. Thinking about a project, we're usually involved in the launch of an effort that's going to, let's say, turn up the MRT and then have a ribbon cutting ceremony when the MRT is available. We don't think about the shutdown or even the disposal of the, the metals and products inside the MRT system. We stop our thinking here when we have our ribbon cutting ceremony. And I can't blame project managers for doing that. We need to be focused on that end. But my coaching is to allow your brain and the team's risk and stakeholder identification to go past that and think about things like, when this is an operation, what threats will there be? What opportunities will there be? <clears throat> Even when this is being disassembled and disposed of, which is very hard for us to think about because we're thinking about the the shiny new product, what kinds of threats and opportunities are there? Now, there's been research on this. Uh, our own BU professor in the Questrom Business School <clears throat> has actually asked the question, and there's some counterintuitive answers here, does a long-term orientation create value? Because most people will say, well, wait a minute, Rich. If I have to spend time on thinking about all this stuff and, and putting in more recycled materials, recyclable materials, and think about safety, and it's going to take me, it's going to be much more expensive. Well, she's done some studies and simulations that showed pretty clear advantages, um, and there's some pretty heavy mathematics in here, that pretty much prove through proxies that long-term orientation is actually value-enhancing. So that's the theory. Let's look at some reality. Um, a gentleman named Gilbert Silvius, and you can see I pronounced the ch, see, that's my two years in the Netherlands, <laughs> um, has done, a, he's a leading thinker in this area. Highly recommend you read his work. Um, start with green project management, but um, read his works as well. Um, he mapped, did a lot of studying and mapped project success on the vertical axis to sustainable PM, meaning how much effort was put into sustainability thinking on projects and how successful they were. And of course, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but there's a definite correlation 
between the two, a positive correlation between the two. And this is not all new thinking. I'm taking you back to ancient times. And by ancient, I mean 1988, um, where doctors Pinto and Slevin, Jeffrey Pinto, I know actually, um, who looked at project management from two sides. Um, a On the yellow side here, the left side, the usual classic project management, time, cost, and scope, or time, cost, performance. And we measure success that way. But guess what? That's not how our customers measure it. That's not how your riders will measure it on the MRT. They think about the other side. Instead of time, cost, cost and scope, they're thinking about use, satisfaction, and effectiveness. That's the client view. And success is really at the center of this, and it really needs to be both. Okay, now I have a quiz for you. Here's a quiz question. In your homes, and I'm not sure how it is in Indonesia, but in your homes, probably, or apartments, you have a, I don't know, one meter by one meter by one meter, roughly, box. Sitting next to it is another roughly one meter by one meter by one meter box, or maybe it's on one is on top of the other. Um, and the second one kind of does the opposite of what the first one does. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone have any idea? Let me give you a hint. One makes things wet and one makes things dry. A washing machine? So, yeah, we're talking about a washing machine. <laughs> um, a washing machine has an impact on the environment, clearly. Um, but this chart is showing where that impact comes from in terms of pollution, energy consumption, and so forth. When you manufacture that washing machine, of course, there's um, effort involved in doing that. There's effort and in, in impact to the environment in distributing it and in disposing of it. But the biggest by far impact comes from use and in particular heating the water. So if you were Procter & Gamble or seventh generation or a company, um, I don't know the equivalent Indonesian manufacturers that makes laundry detergents, you could be thinking about a large scale project to reduce your impact on the environment by maybe changing the shipping routes for your product, changing the thickness of the wall of the plastic containers, um, maybe even using plant-based plastics and, uh, and chemicals in the laundry detergent. Or if you were smarter, you might put your effort based on this into allowing your product to work in cold water, because that's really where all the energy is, is impacted. So that's an example of what's called um, life cycle assessment. I won't go into the detail. There are UN standards around this, uh, ISO standards. You see the ISO 14,000 standard referenced pretty poorly in the bottom with white text on light blue background. Note to self, need to change that. Um, there are companies out there that sell software that help developers of software, hardware, even large-scale projects do, um, through simulations, checks on making changes in materials and seeing what the effect would be in the long-term use of that product. And again, this has been for about at least about a decade. Sustainable Minds, as a matter of fact, is right across the Charles River from uh, Boston University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There are other software tools like this. There's something that you might find interesting from the large-scale project area called the EC3. In fact, has anyone heard of this? the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator. I've given you a link to it. Um, it's free. It's, uh, it's um, crowdsourced. Um, it will provide really nice dashboard information like this when you plug in information about construction. So I would highly recommend you take a look at this. There's actually a presentation about um, this, the use of this and the reason for using it. Here, it actually comes from Sustainable Minds, um, our, our, our neighbor in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So our conundrum, our, our problem as project managers is that we aren't this guy here. We don't look out far into the future. We're focused on these things like get it done, and we don't think about the long term. 
we tend to be looking at our Gantt chart, our project like this, in terms of tasks and milestones and threats that come up. And our back is to what we see as a point in time, that moment when the project turns over, a ribbon cutting ceremony. What if, what if we switch things around and instead take that point in time, which isn't at all a point, that's forever. <laughs> we take that point and stretch that out and let our project, just for thinking purposes, become a point in time. Because guess what? After, after 10 years, your project is nothing but a memory. And think about the threats and opportunities and benefits that occur in the long term and bring those back into our planning. How about that? I think that would make a difference. We need both views. We need the getter done view. We also need the long-term view. Um, one thing we can think of to do this, or at least to measure where you are, and I don't know how familiar you are. Does anyone know what movie I'm referring to here with the ruby slippers? Anyone? This is a pretty, pretty well-known film. One of the first color films. Wizard of Oz. In The Wizard of Oz, um, Dorothy, the main protagonist, um, wants to go home. She's whisked off to a fantasy land through a, a tornado and wants to go back home. The good witch tells her that all you have to do is click your heels three times and say, there's no place like home. Well, I've used that click and home as an analogy to web pages because we do a lot of clicking and go to home pages. So I come up with this idea of a three click challenge where you, you click three times and see where you end up or how long it takes you to end up on a web page that enumerates how your company or organization will become socially, environmentally, long-term um, thinker, thinkers, including commitments you might make to things like carbon extraction and um, social responsibility. I'm going to skip this slide in the uh, interest of time and go back to Boston's Big Dig. What are some of the things we could do as project managers, as construction planners, as long um, as large scale construction folks? What could we do to prevent what happened, for example, in Boston's Big Dig? I assert that this may not have happened if the planners had thought about just for the planning purposes, what happens five years from now? Open it up, let devil's advocacy take place. Let people speak up and say, what about this? What about this? My Dutch friends would be very proud of me with their directness and with their willingness to come up with these risks. I experienced that for two years. Um, people thinking in terms of outcomes, benefits, and value instead of outputs only. Apply the concept, as PMI tells us to do, of overall project risk. Um, incentivize, as opposed to censoring, truth to power, speaking of truth to power. Um, I don't want to get off on the tangent, but the um, Boeing 737 MAX 8 is another example of this. Um, I, I actually have a chapter in a book coming up about that. I'm going to talk about that actually in a moment. Um, so these are things that would help us. All right. The most important question for many people is, does this pay off, right? So as this child is thinking, show me the money. Well, actually, I've shown you some theory. In practice, um, this organization called Just Capital tracks 100 companies that have made commitments to sustainability and looks at those companies compared to the overall market. And they have outperformed the market for uh, over a year. In fact, um, this is very recent, um, only a week or two old. Uh, a week, exactly. Actually, less than a week. This article comes from Harvard Business Review. Um, it suggests that you take a look at it. Um, it's about the fact that investing in ESG, that's environment, social, and governance, pays off. Also, I have written a, a chapter in a book called The Handbook of Responsible Project Management. It has examples, including the Boeing 787 MAX, 737 MAX 8, 
uh, including uh, a disaster that occurred down the street from me from Columbia Gas of Massachusetts, where we had 180 um, buildings have fires or explosions in them because of a problem with the way that a gas project was done. Anyway, there's a chapter um, dedicated to irresponsibility in project management, and it covers some of this idea of long-term thinking. This book uh, comes out in September of this year. Same people who are helping to produce that book also have a, a nonprofit called responsiblepm.com. And they have a manifesto, just like the Agile Manifesto, where they talk about things that we value more than other things. Uh, I put it here for your reference. Um, highly suggest that you check out responsiblepm.com. So my message to you is to think through not just two, but beyond the end of your large scale project. I, not that it means that much for me, but I am giving you a green light to do that and to think past the um, end of your project's end date. Now I have a brief appendix. Um, oh, first of all, I wanted to say, and I won't be able to pronounce this, but I'll try. Terima kasi atas perhatian anda. Uh -huh. That's nice to pronounce. Excellent. <laughs> um, my contact information is here. Um, now, just to let you know, I've been working on this so long. There are some tools um, in the follow-up book we wrote to Green Project Management. We do have something called Sustainability Radar. And what it lets you do is look at your project managers and your project management maturity along six different six dimensions. Different. Um, and along those dimensions, if you're doing really poorly, for example, in all six, you would become a laggard. Um, if you were um, really good at telling the world that you're sustainable, but you really are not, you would be greenwasher. And so you actually get a little bit of a signature after you do these survey questions um, within your company and find out which of these different um, attributes you are or characters you are, and then there are solutions in the book as to what do you do if you are a laggard or a leader or a shy drone. Actually, if you're a leader, you don't have to do anything. So I'm going to stop there because it's just about the time frame when I think we should turn this over for questions. Um, but these the appendix, I'll provide the slides um, so that you can have all this other stuff, um, these goodies for yourselves. And I'll go to the um, um, back to my thank you slide. And we can discuss this amongst ourselves. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Altman, for your lecture. Lots of examples there you know, with the Boston Big Dick and also uh, the Deep Water Horizon, the MRT Jakarta, and, and some other examples there. Uh, it is interesting to see the sustainability radar, and I'd like to learn further about that uh, later. And uh, yeah, let's let's go to the Q and A. And we have uh, some participants uh, raise their hands, and I would like to give the first opportunity to our lecturer, yeah, Dr. Aris Firman, who also teach the project management in our MBA program. So, Pak Aris, silakan, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you you're in the car now. <laughs> yes, right, right. I'm in the meeting now. Well, uh, thank you, Rich. I think it is a very interesting sharing from you. And I try to combine all the elements that you have mentioned with one major question from me, comparing what's going on in the States and also what we are go doing now here in Indonesia, especially in the infrastructure project. I believe that most of your projects are based on a very sound studies, either it is feasibility studies or anything, because what we are talking just now is mostly on the execution stage, but the project life cycle starts from the initiation, planning and so forth. Now, my biggest question is in our country, sometimes these big projects related to sustainability is not only technical, financial and economical dri driven, but it is in most cases, or in some cases, it is political driven. And in that case, all these kind of good things that you have mentioned have been put away or put aside. Put aside, so, yes. So we are just, I, I just want to share one of the major projects that 
going on now with the target of completing by the end of this year. The very big example is another transportation project with tunnels. I was a tunnel engineer 40 years ago, and I was wondering with this example of big dig could happen also in our case, having our project connecting the capital city of Jakarta with Bandung with our university or campus of ITB, the high-speed train. This high-speed train, I'm wondering whether the feasibility study is there or not, whether we can make some comments and things like that. So it is also related to your statement about stakeholders management. To me, the most difficult part of all these chapters or all these areas of project management in the PM book is the stakeholders management. So what do you think? If I'm assigned as a project manager for this high-speed train with very heavy political driven, what shall I do? Thank you. So it's a really good question. And I was, it, it was, I was trying to find statements in um, the family of web pages related to the MRT that talked about uh, um, the government's commitment to sustainability. And I, as I said, I kind of had a force in the idea. I'm going back to that slide now. I'm trying to go back to that slide. The answer is, first of all, I want to agree with your point about stakeholder management. And actually, the new PMBOK guide, which actually had a little bit of a hand in editing, I was on the editorial board. So the seventh edition PMBOK guide, this guy, does finally mention sustainability, <laughs> um, does finally talk about long-term thinking and expands the thinking a little bit. And to your point about stakeholders, it talks much more about stakeholder engagement and a broader casting a broader net when it comes to identifying stakeholders. But your question, I think very good one, is when there's a politically driven project, one that has to be, you know, you really want, the, the government really wants that one to get done because they want to be reelected. Maybe for, maybe it's not such a, shallow purpose maybe they they um they really have the public's um interest in mind and want this um, high-speed rail to be done they could easily forget about um sustainability so if i look at the vision statement here it is um there's no mention here of sustainability per se they talk about efficient that could just mean getting from place a to place b quickly there's no mention here about low carbon or no, low impact or without disruption to, to local villages. There's no mention of any of that here, which I found a bit off-putting. Um, but I was going to try to trace what does the government statements say about sustainability, because that should have made it into here. Had that made it into here, the decisions that project managers make for example, what material to make the rail out of and, and um, how much uh, engagement with local um, towns and villages do we make before we disrupt their neighborhoods would be, would be built in if that was part of the vision, or at least it has a better chance of being built in. So I, I don't know if I even approached your question with an answer, but I fully agree that stakeholder management is key. I just finished teaching a class where I was talking about the T model, you know, wide and deep when you identify stakeholders. And I said, by the way, it applies to stakeholders because it also applies to risk. Each stakeholder brings threat and opportunity with them. And therefore, if you fail to identify a stakeholder, there's a whole family of threats and opportunities you just have left completely aside. And now you'll have to deal with them as pop-up issues like the big dig had to when things start falling off walls. I don't know. Okay. So did I come close yes. to your question? Thank you. Uh, uh, another question, because uh, in terms of stakeholders management and stakeholder engagement, the most difficult part is to convince, in my case, is the government and how we can convince them that it is not a kind of doing project for the sake of getting the project done with or having this kind of extension of time, 
cost of run, time of run, whatever the expenses is, as long as the project is completed within my term of power and things like that. How yes. to, to express this as full as you explain about the sustainability issues? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, you did fade out a couple of times there, but it, it, it goes back to the idea um, of what is the government telling the people that it serves about its goals to become more responsible, more, um, you know, environmentally conscious uh, to meet UN SDGs and so forth. Most governments have very strong statements about that. And if they're making those promises, you have to call them to task on those promises too, which means they may have to say, look, this project is, I'll give you an example from BU, okay? Boston University is building a data science building and that, that building is going to be carbon negative. Now it's going to take longer to do that, but it's going to be a it's going to be actually a carbon sink, based on plants and trees they're growing there, and and, and recyclable materials and um, geothermal wells that are dug under the building. Of course, that takes much more money and time, but because BU, as an organization, has made pledges and statements to the city and to the students and to the faculty and staff about their mission. Um, BU's climate action plan has these statements, then they're excused for being six months later uh, and spending another extra million dollars or two <laughs> to, to accomplish these things. But then they have this prize of a, of a building that is, is removing carbon from the atmosphere, um, which is kind of a, a bragging right. But, but if the president of BU is looking only at his, it happens to be a he, his term in office, you are right. He's likely to say, the heck with that, or stronger <laughs> language, <laughs> uh, and say, you know, let's just get this done while I'm still president or I'll never get another term. So that is definitely, politics plays heavily in here, but I, I would assert that they should, I mean, I didn't have a chance to research this, but um, uh, my guess is that there are statements coming from the government that talk about Ind Indonesia's commitments to, for example, environmental um, goals of the UN. Thank you. I hope to talk to you again later. Thank you. I hope to, I hope to, um, to see you at some point in Boston and vice versa. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aris Firman. Okay, well, next, uh, we have a question here in the chat box uh, from Boosting Murah Bayu. It has the same ones, I believe, but yeah. Bayu, do you mind to say or to express the question yourself? Go on. Uh, actually, it's the same, but I think. Sorry? It's the same question. Explain? I think it's yeah. the same question, yeah. Okay, okay, so all yeah. clear, yeah? All right, so, so do you have any other questions? All good? Yeah, but, yeah. Okay, thank you all so good, much. But thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, now let's go to uh, Michael, consensus Michael. Uh, go on, Michael. Okay, do you hear my voice, Pak? Very clear. Okay. Uh, good morning, Pak Yudo and Professor Rich. Uh, thank you, Professor Rich, for your lecture this morning. Uh, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Michael from Entrepreneurship MBA Jakarta. Uh, mm -hmm. at the f yeah, hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. At the first slide of your presentation, you mentioned about Indonesia will be the one of the five largest economy country in the world in 2045, right? Uh, I just want to ask about what do you think will be the challenge uh, uh, or the competition that which Indonesia face to be the largest economy in uh, economic country in 2045 in terms of project management and sustainability environment? Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, to be so, there's two. There's actually you you um, saw that there's re, there's resistance to the idea of investing in ESG because the the stereotype is that it's going to slow you down. But then when you look at the actual uh, investment towards the end of the presentation, um, there's there's actually a, a, there's actually a outperformance when when companies invest in ESG. I would assert that when a nation invests in ESG, they will also outperform the market. This is the problem of having too many slides with too much animation. Okay, so never do this. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I would assert that if Indonesia does, the, and I am not an economic, uh, I think you should talk to Professor Videnska about this, um, but I would assert that these rules or findings right here, finally, um, that investing in ESG, environment, social, and, gover and governance, um, seems to indicate that uh, companies outperform the market. I would say the same would apply for, for, for nations. By the same token, there are there are some shocks to the system, as you know, that have come up that are probably going to prevent most um, economic development. Um, speaking, of course, of COVID and uh, the conflict in Ukraine and Russia right now. Um, I just was reading reports about that's going to set most e economies back a couple of years in terms of their goals. So not by way of excuse, but by matter of fact, I think that's going to uh, prevent that. Now, you asked the sub question, which was uh, becoming a, an expert in or a leader in sustainability and project management. And to that, I would say read the seventh edition PMBOK, look at um, uh, the responsibility, um, the responsible PM.org, jump on the kind of the bandwagon of project managers who are saying, I'm going to think a little bit more deeply and more broadly about my project and not just get it done on time. I am going to still focus on getting it done on time, but I am going to work very hard to think about what it means to people who will be using this product in the long term. Um, again, I, I will use the Boeing example. Um, there is a there is a Netflix video that came out called Downfall. Downfall about yeah. this uh, about the Boeing seven thirty seven, and if I remember right, it was. Um, Ethiopia and Indonesia that had the two crashes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was uh, Lion Air. Lion Air, correct. Yeah, um, which actually is a very fairly safe airline. Um, but um, if you watch this, it's very depressing. So I, I tell people watch it in chunks. Um, you you see the culture that led to the decisions that would allow them to launch this plane before it was really ready. And a lot of them, a lot of the reasoning for that launch came from same as BP came from very narrow thinking. Um, I would say use that. I mean, you have the, you have the, the, um, that example, uh, that local, very tragic example to hold up when you're talking about projects, we don't want another, you know, a crash like that. It was tragic. I mean, I can't even express it. And you watch the show and I mean, you just cry. It's just, it's it, cause it was so preventable. Um, and, and, and the decisions that were made all had to do with launching the project, launch the project. We have to beat Airbus. And um, it's the same thinking that um, Ariel Aries was talking about. If I'm saying his name, right. Um, that, you know, the focus is on, we got to get this done for political reasons. In this case, it was for it was for political slash sales reasons. And it, <laughs> the thing is, it worked. They took over from they took over from Airbus. Orders for the Airbus went down, and orders for the Max Eight went up. Like that, just they crossed each other like this. It worked in the short term, but then we end up with people um, being um, jailed and with obviously with um, very, very bad results. I don't even want to say it, but very bad results. So um, sorry to end on that note, but um, thank you for the question. I hope I approached it a little bit. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, yeah, quite depressing to watch that movie as well and just showing, you know, the negligence of, of the Boeing on, on how to launch that airplane. All right. Uh, I think uh, that's all, yeah. Uh, Pa'aris, do you have any other questions? Because you raise your hands, Pa'aris. Or perhaps you mistakenly uh, uh, press the button, right? So thank you so much, Rich, uh, You're for, welcome. for the lecture. It's quite an interesting uh, lecture with a lot of uh, cases showing that uh, sustainability cannot be separated from a project management as well. And you're right about uh, the ASD, so that uh, starting next semester, we also launch our new course that we name it as ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance 
showing that actually the focus should be on the issue of sustainability and also the environment, social, and also governance. All right, okay. uh, students, Good. participants, lectures, uh, let's give a warm applause for Professor Rich Mossman for uh, the uh, lecture. And yeah, hopefully it is not going to be the last time because yes, uh, we expect to have you further in our session. And for students and other participants, we'll have two more sessions yeah, with Boston University. One is with Professor Podenska. I think she's here. Yeah, so tonight at 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Yeah, Mbak well, Neta. Oh, 8 p.m. tonight. 9. 8, 8, oh, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 p.m. Yeah. 8 p.m. Uh, Jakarta and time tonight yes. about financial technology. And on Friday, we will have uh, Dr. Ben Harris about uh, data analytics. All right, before we uh, close this session, let's have a group picture together, shall we? Yeah. All right, so uh, who's going to help? Ma Arisa, are you here? Hello, Pa Yudo. Oh, okay. Ma, Ma, oh, Mas Guru here. Yeah. Uh, Pa Yudo, we do have a certificate for Prof. Oh, okay. uh, Rich. All right, very good. Uh, Rich, do you mind to stop share your slides so that we can show you the session? You know, you're asking me to stop sharing, and I'm a very selfish person, but I'll stop. Hold on, here we go. <laughs> I know. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, go on, All right. Thank you. And to the students, study hard for your <laughs> tests and quizzes. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, Masguru, you want to share your slides? 